Um, but what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll try to show you a bit of what we do in our research and make the connections between computer science and architecture. And uh, it's quite interesting that when I started studying computer science, one of my uh, computer science professors was actually making references to architecture uh, a lot. So he was basically saying that you know when we learn programming, that's comparable to brick lane. It has nothing to do with you know designing software. We have to become more like architects. That was always his credo. We have to become more like architects. See the global picture. You know, go away from this local hacking that we always used to do and become, um, you know, more global um, scientists. And I think this uh, interaction, often when people think about computer science, they think about programming. Um, but when you talk about architecture, you don't necessarily think about bricklaying. Right? So I want to also draw your attention that computer science is a lot more than um, laying bricks. Um, and the way I'm going to structure my talk is uh, I'll have two parts. I'll start with um, a topic in geometry optimization, which is something we've done research in um, for a number of years now. And I'll briefly present um, a library that we released um, that also has plugins for Rhino, and it's been integrated into Kangaroo that some of you might know. Um, I'll try to give you a flavor of the type of algorithms that are used there. And then in the second part, I'll show you some projects that I think have a connection to architecture. Um, and I also, along the way, I want to tell you a little bit about the process that we use in our research and hopefully get you some ideas on how some of these techniques can be applied in your work. So let me get started on geometry optimization. Um, now, geometry is something that I guess you're all working with uh, every day. Uh, it's central to um, design. and. Typically, for me at least, the way I see geometry is as a medium to express different things. And in architecture in particular, the geometry that we're designing uh, is informed by many factors. It could be the material that we're using, the specific aesthetics that we're trying to achieve, maybe a construction process, the performance of the design uh, in many different ways. And there's many other factors. Right? So geometry is a, a representation, but it has to account for many different uh, factors that determine uh, its shape. And how do we create geometry? Well, we start with some very simple building blocks. So probably the most simple piece of geometry is a point. You can also call it a vertex or a node or a particle, depending on the context. Um, and we take these primitives and assemble more complex objects. Another primitive is an edge connecting two points, or a triangle, um, or maybe a circle. And you can think of many other geometric primitives that you're used to in modeling, and then you know designing something more interesting or more complex is putting these things together in the right way. If you look at just the collection of triangles, then you know here it's not particularly um, interesting, but often we deal with ensembles of these primitives that then define a more global structure. And this is something that we would call connectivity or topology or structure. Um, and if you look at these two representations, on both sides we have the same number of triangles. And I just want to um, talk about this in a more, uh, let's say, quantitative way, and looking at what we call degrees of freedom. How do you describe this set of triangles? The way you would represent this is by saying that, okay, I have in this case 10 triangles. Each triangle has three points, and each point has three coordinates, x, y, z, if we're living in three. So we can represent these triangles by 90 numbers, with 90 degrees of freedom, variables that we can change. If we look at the triangle mesh on the other side, it's actually quite different. Here we have 11 vertices, and each vertex has three coordinates, so we only have 33 degrees of freedom. So where does that difference come about? Well, another way of thinking of this mesh on the right as compared to just a random soup of triangles is that in a mesh, we enforce the constraint that a certain set of vertices have to actually coincide. Right? So if you take these five vertices and put them to the same point, you're going to create this vertex here that connects all these triangles. And if you do some counting, you'll see that all of these constraints um, that make these vertices coincide actually account for the missing degrees of freedom. So one way to think of a triangle mesh is just a bunch of, a collection of triangles that satisfies certain constraints. And this is something that we use a lot in our, uh, in our work. 
this notion of constraints is very central in how we work with geometry. So if you look at the types of primitives I showed you earlier, what could be constraints um, that you might want to apply here? If you take a vertex, for example, you might want to constrain it to a certain position. You might want to say, OK, this point has to go over here. If you have an edge, which could be a beam in a, in a construction, for example, uh, it might have a certain length that you want, or maybe a range of lengths. So you can constrain um, the length of the, the beam. Uh, for a triangle, you might have constraints on the area or on the angles. And for a circle, for example, you might have a constraint on the radius. Um, these type of constraints allow you to do design, as I will show you in a second. But you can have more, um, let's say, high-level constraints. For example, you might want to say that a set of points should be collinear or coplanar. Um, if you're modeling with polygonal meshes, you might want to ensure that your polygons are planar. For example, if it's a glass facade, that you don't have curved glass elements. Or points might need to lie on a circle for certain design or construction reasons. Or you want a surface that is smooth. Or maybe you want certain symmetries. What all these things have in common is that we can represent them very explicitly in mathematical form. And now, one way to look at modeling, to actually creating geometry, is to say that you take all of these um, criteria that inform your geometry, the structural performance, let's say, or constraints in the construction of the material, and you translate them into constraints. Constraints on the geometric primitives. Okay? This is a, a task that allows you to abstract um, these criteria out there in a geometric form that then allows you to do computation. That's sort of the key that you, know, you take something that might be abstract, for example, the energy performance of your building, and you map it into geometric constraints that you can do computation. That's not a trivial task. In order to understand how this works, I want to introduce one notion that um, is very important for us, and that's the idea of a shape space. Um, and there's many ways this word is used, so I'm trying to um, give you one specific definition. If you look at this design, this is a, a quadrilateral mesh, then if you keep the, the mesh topology, the connectivity fixed, you can represent this design just by saying, where are the x, y, z coordinates of each of those vertices? Okay? You can stack up all of these numbers. And again, in this case, if we have n vertices, we have three n degrees of freedom. And I'm going to represent these three n numbers just as a point, this is just a visualization, in 2D. So you have to think of this point as actually a point in a three n dimensional space. Now, I don't know about you, I have difficulty thinking about more than three dimensions. So let's stick with this 2D abstraction, but you have to keep in mind it's just a visualization. Okay. So what this means is that this point now represents this shape. Because if I know all three n coordinates, I have the shape completely determined. Okay. And now I can look at other shapes in this, in this space. This shape over here is the same connectivity, just different vertex coordinates, gives me a different point in my shape space. Or this one, or that one, and so on. Or even this just flat point. Now, these shapes that I show here are not random shapes. Right? I didn't pick these coordinates randomly. They actually share some geometric properties. And the properties they share are the following. If I take a parameter line, for example, these two here, then these shapes all satisfy the property that these lines lie on circles, as you can see here. Okay? So not only lie, do they have all these points of this curved line at plane, they also lie on a circle. So you can actually take circular elements and construct um, these surfaces. And this constraint, and there's a second constraint, that we also want the the polygons to be as square as possible. They should be squares. And these constraints define what we call a shape space. So among all possible designs with this topology, there is a fairly small, but still you know, very expressive set of shapes that I show here with blue that um, satisfies these constraints. Now, the constraints <coughs> in this specified as should lie on a circle, should be squares, so it's actually more of a fuzzy notion. If you want to strictly make these things lie on circles and be squares, the only shapes you could do are cylinders, which would be pretty boring. So you can enforce them to be circles, but then you have to do a certain trade-off on how square they can be. Now, if you want to do design 
in such a constrained system, this is very hard. And the reason is that all of your elements are globally coupled. If you look at a single vertex, then what happens is that there's at least two constraints, namely that this vertex should lie on two circles. Um, so each vertex can be affected by multiple constraints, and each constraint, for example, for this blue line, affects multiple vertices. And what this means is that if you change one point, potentially the whole design needs to change. So if you want to s satisfy these constraints manually, this is extremely difficult. And this is where optimization comes into play. So here's a little illustration. In this system, we take this plane, we pin down these four points at the corner, and we have a little handle that we can move around. And as you move this point, of course, if I lift this vertex up, my constraints are violated. Right? The points will not line a circle anymore. So we run an algorithm that actually solves for a solution that guarantees that you go back to the circular case. And this allows you to do very easy and interactive design where the system takes care of the constraints and you can explore the shapes um, that you would like to design. So when you're done, um, at any stage, you know that you're very close to a solution that is circular and plain. Okay, so how does something like this work? Um, I want to give you just a flavor of this algorithm because I think it's important to understand a little bit of the underlying machinery. And I'm going to take a very simple example. I'm going to take a single quadrilateral. That's my design. And, you know, it contains four points that if I stack them all up would actually give me a 12-dimensional shape space, but I represent this shape space just in 2D. So this point x corresponds to this quadrilateral. And now my goal is to only design the squares. Okay, so this uh, quadrilateral here is not a square, but somewhere in my shape space there is the space of all squares that I call C1 here. And x is not a square, so x is outside of this blue region. So now what I want to do, or what the algorithm will do, is if I give you this as input, I want to find the closest square, the square that, or the shape that satisfies my constraint of being a square, but it has, that is as close as possible to the input I started with. Because I might have designed something, I might have drawn something that violates my constraints, and I want the computer to tell me where I should go. And in this case, mathematically what we're trying to achieve, but the formula is not so important, is we try to find the closest point. And geometrically that just means that we're trying to move x into the blue region, um, but traveling the shortest distance necessary. Okay. And then this point y corresponds to a new shape, and this is that square here. So the blue square is the one where I move the vertices the least amount possible in order to become a square. Okay. And that's something we call the local step, as I will explain in a second. Okay, a single square, you would argue, is not a particularly interesting design. Um, what happens if you have more shapes? Okay. Let's say you have this as an input and you want all of these um, elements to become squares. And what we can do is we can find locally you know, the closest square for this corner, the closest square for that corner, or this one, or that one. But in the end, we want all of these shapes to be squares. And now we have a set of conflicting constraints um, over here. And what that means is that a single vertex, for example, the center vertex here, has four positions that it wants to go to in order to satisfy its constraint. So we have to somehow make them come to a common point. And this is in our optimization called the global step. In some sense, it negotiates the conflicting constraints. So it tries to achieve a consensus, if you will. If you cannot go like these four points do not agree, well, try to find a point that agrees as much as possible. And that's the underlying architecture of the solver. Now, I understand that this might, if you're not familiar with optimization, uh, seem very abstract. Um, but just to summarize what is nice about this approach is that you can do all of these local steps, fitting these um, squares in parallel. You can do it very fast. And probably more important, um, you can design your own constraints. I think this is fundamentally important because if you have a design task, um, you probably end up uh, having to satisfy constraints that are not given in a specific system. And then the global step, that's the more complicated thing, um, that brings all of these constraints together again. That's something that you never have to touch. Um, it's given in the system and you don't have to ever change it. And then you iterate between those two. So I'll show you some examples. 
Um, here, you have an input design, uh, quadrilateral mesh again, and the goal is now to make these um, facets planar, for example, if you want to do a glass facade with planar faces, or to make them circular. Circular means that the four points of the quadrilateral line are circle. And this has nice properties, for example, um, you know that there's a, a planar offset surface if you want to do um, support structures. So what the algorithm does, it starts with this configuration and then it changes the positions and it tries to stay as close as possible to the input while satisfying the constraints. So circularity is a stricter constraint, so the shape deviates more. Okay, but you don't have to take care of these constraints yourself. If you would like to manually move the vertices around in order to satisfy the constraints, this would be very hard. So we took this system and a bunch of more things and tried to bring them into um, a library. This is always a big challenge in research. You know, how do you take your research and make it applicable? So our goal, I would probably stress simple and extensible as the most important. Because one thing I've learned is that if you want people to use your things, they better be simple. Um, so this is an open source library, uh, and we spent quite a bit of time to integrate it into Grasshopper and Rhino, so here's a little demo. This is an example where you have a design, uh, in this case you want to make sure the, the faces stay planar. Um, there's one or two other constraints. So you can just take your Grasshopper plugin, there's a list of about 10, 15 different constraints that you can combine, uh, and very easily you can build your own interactive system. Um, you can also do dynamics, so you can do gravity and uh, inertia in this kind of setup. This is a very simple example, it's an old video. Um, but you can do real-time physical exploration. Uh, and this is an example of kangaroo that's moving on. Here's another example of circular meshes. Here you can see that each quadrilateral um, actually lies on a circle. So that can be an important design criterion. By the way, um, Feel free to interrupt me at any time. I might be going a bit too fast. The goal here is not to you know, give you detailed explanations of how these algorithms work. I just want to show you, you know, sort of on a high level what, what kind of flavor uh, these methods have. And if you're interested, there's a website where you can get all the source code. There's Rhino um, um, or Grasshopper definitions that use it. Uh, Anders here, who's an architect from CETA in Copenhagen, worked, on, worked with us on this. Uh, here's a bunch of things on his website as well. And uh, these are the main people that actually made this work. OK. So this was an overview of a very kind of general type of work that we, we do. Very basic functionality in geometric optimization. And now I want to show you a few projects that partially use this type of optimization to design specific things. And I'll start with wire meshes. Um, Nina, do you have a, a piece? Oh. Sorry, just to show you what that is, I, I let this pass on. Um, so the idea of this project was basically to, to see how a material can inform design. So wire meshes, in this case, it's a very simple example. I, I'll not let this pass around. It's a material that has specific properties. So in, in this case, and there's many different variants of it, um, it's basically composed of a weaving of wires. And the inspiration of this project actually didn't come from architecture, it came from art. Uh, I saw these um, fairly amazing statues that artists designed, and I was wondering, you know, how did they do this, um, and what is possible with such a material? And what they do is actually they do this by hand. You know, they sort of form these things by hand. Um, but you quickly learn that there's a, a lot of constraints and restrictions when you want to design with such a material. So our goal was, can we take a digital geometric model and find a way to approximate the shape with such a material. And why would this be difficult? Well, this is a material, for example, that doesn't allow you to stretch the wires. Right? You cannot, it's not like rubber that you can wrap around any shape. And we'll see more concretely what these um, strains are. But I also want to use this um, as an example to illustrate a bit how we do our research. So when we look at a problem like this, um, and I guess that's probably similar in architecture, we first try to gain some intuition. Okay, we play, basically. And in this case, we wanted to understand the material. So we created a little wooden scaffold, and 
we now basically just try to see, can we wrap this material around this 3D shape? Okay, so you play with it and you see um, relatively quickly that this is very hard. And it's something that you all know, if, for example, you want to wrap um, a sphere with a piece of paper, you know, it has to either tear or fold up. Now this material is more flexible in some sense than paper because it can also shear. But the complexity of creating such a shape actually stems from the fact that um, there is a very complex coupling within this material. If you press down a certain part of the object, something else pops up. Okay? It's a global uh, coupling um, implicit in this material. And this is really a challenge for design because if you try to sort of continuously lay out a shape, if you try to wrap something around, um, any decision you make at the beginning might have impacts on something far in the future. It's very hard to predict. So it's basically um, very constraining to do this manually. And to understand this material better, we also did some physical testing. So what you can see when you play with it, um, you cannot stretch it in the directions of the wire, but you can shear it relatively easily in the diagonal direction, but at some point the shear resistance becomes high. Okay, so then we're trying to look into an appropriate theory. In the end, we want to do computation, right? So in order to do computation on something, we have to formalize things. And in this case, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there is actually a very convenient mathematical model of this type of material, the so-called Chebyshev method. And basically what it says that is, I cannot stretch this material in the U and V direction of the wires, but I can shear it in the diagonal direction. And if you take this model and you look into the theory, there's some really interesting mathematical results that we can exploit. Now, complicated formulas, I promise you I will not throw many of those at you. And it's not so important what this formula says in particular, but the important thing that it says is that because the material can shear, we can actually get double curve structures. Okay? You probably know if you take a piece of paper, you can curve it or you can bend it, but only in a way that you get single curvature. Okay? Um, this material, and only because it has this shearing capability, which paper doesn't have, right, can actually assume curvature. And this is a, a fairly important result, but there's one thing that makes our life hard, and that's another formula that I will also not explain in detail, I'll just illustrate it um, graphically. What this formula says is that is if you take a rectangular piece of this material, and you try to wrap it around a curved shape, at most, you can get a total curvature of 2 pi. And that's the curvature of a half sphere. Okay? So you can take a rectangular piece of this wire mesh and wrap it around a half sphere, but not more. Okay? So you cannot take such a rectangular piece and get more of the sphere, like a full sphere. Okay. That's a mathematical fact. And here, I'll show you a wire mesh which does cover a full sphere. So how is that possible? I just told you it's not possible, and here I'll show you an example where it is possible. And the reason why this is possible is that when I looked at this formula, I said you take a rectangular and, in fact, axis-aligned piece of this material. This is more like a, um, what you get in these onion nets. Okay? And the reason why this doesn't violate this mathematical formula I showed you earlier is that the formula only applies to rectangular areas that are aligned with the wires. And by laying out the mesh diagonally, like this, you actually don't get large um, rectangular pieces. Okay? But here you have this constraint, this curvature constraint for each of those, those red triangles, and they are uh, red rectangles, and they overlap. And that actually explains or gives a mathematical explanation of why we have this global coupling. If I push somewhere, um, the change in curvature can actually propagate through the entire surface. And this is extremely difficult to, to optimize for. But taking this theory, and again, it's not so important what the, the details of the math are here, but the important thing is that we can have an abstraction of a material, a physical material and its properties, which of course you know, neglect certain aspects, we can map it to a mathematical model, and that allows us to do computation. And as I said, the goal, and I'm not going to explain this either in too much detail, the goal is to take a reference surface and approximate it, like for example this torso, 
with such a wire mesh, satisfying the constraint that the material is not extensible along the wires, and that there is a certain shear shearing that we can uh, assume. And this is an optimization, a global optimization that runs in the background as you design with your surface. So I'll show you how this looks like in practice. Then, of course, the challenge is how do you take this very computational approach into a design process. So here is an example, um, I actually know if it's running, it's not, of how you design with our system. So you take your input surface and you actually manually control the layout of this wire mesh. Now, the thing that is very specific about this approach is, and this is the first time I believe that anybody has done something like this, is all the art pieces that you saw um, are not closed surfaces. And this is simply because, you know, if you want to create a closed surface like this torso, as things wrap around and where they come together, you would have to predict up front, when you start deforming, where these wires match up in the end. This is something, because of the global coupling, that is impossible to do manually. I, I challenge you to <laughs> take a piece of wire mesh and try to make a torso that closes up. Nobody has ever done that before. Um, so here, um, the algorithm does that for you, and you start with a course defined approach because you want to be able to control the layout a bit more. And then what we also want to do is we want to validate this, so that's why we want to fabricate examples. And once we're given the computational um, solution, in this case we build a simple scaffold, but because we have exact calculation of the shape, we can actually take this shape and lay it out flat, and we know that this maps to a flat piece of wire mesh. Okay. So you see these scaffold lines here, and we know exactly where they go, and we know that if we close this up, this will close up perfectly. So then we can fabricate this, uh, and we just pin it onto this model, um, which is a fairly complicated manual process. Of course, this is a small scale model. The point is, if you would do this on a large scale, things would fit together. Okay. So this is the model here, which you know, we didn't fit together very well. Um, you know, which is sort of stitched together at this side, which looks pretty ugly. But the point is that it would fit together perfectly. And this is something if you want to use this for a more freeform facade, you can actually optimize for a shape um, where you have no singularities. Everything is continuous and smooth and fits together. Right? That's, that's the, the promise of, of this global optimization. This is a little mock-up we did. And of course, now you can start to optimize for other things, like for example, the shading performance of such a facade um, or other factors. Okay, let me quickly show another project uh, which has more to do with assembly. So this project was actually motivated, I get a lot of motivation by just walking into toy stores, I don't know where you get your motivation from, but I hang out a lot in museum design stores and, and children's toy stores. Um, so this project came about by seeing toys like this. And this is actually a construction that is used for all kinds of things. And the idea is basically to take planar pieces uh, and build three-dimensional shapes by intersecting them. And you've seen some of these constructions even at the architectural scale. Why is this interesting? Well, because it's very easy to create um, two-dimensional shapes. You can use a laser cutter um, or some other cutting machine. Um, and then you can assemble them into 3D shapes. So here we looked at different types of doing this. Um, I'll just explain this very briefly. So um, if you take a laser cutter that you know, cuts your material orthogonally, and you want to make these connections by sliding pieces into each other, then the fact that you cut orthogonally, if you want to keep the connection tight, means that any two of these pieces have to intersect at the right angle. So for this kind of construction, you get very easy fabrication. You get a stable structure, but the design opportunities are not that great because everything has to intersect at the right angle. OK, we could use a, a more sophisticated cutting machine. We could cut at angles, for example, with a CNC mill. Um, and then we get more flexibility in the design. We also have a stable structure because the pieces fit together tightly. But we might have to invest more into the fabrication. And there is a, a compromise between the two, where we use a laser cutter, but we make the slits a little bit more open, which allows us to still use a simple fabrication technology. Uh, it gives us the flexibility of having angled intersection, 
but it, it compromises stability and structural soundness. Right? You can have configurations where these pieces would actually um, flap around these, these hinges, but you can take the combination of multiple pieces to get a rigid, stable construction back. So how do you design with something like this, and why is this difficult? So first, again, we need to abstract um, a design or a construction like this. In our case, um, we use what we call a constraint graph. If you look at this simple toy example, you have five of these planar pieces that intersect. Each piece is represented by a node, a little circle here. And we put an edge between two pieces um, if they actually intersect. Okay, so in this case, you see you have this cycle here, these are those four pieces that mutually intersect, and then this one piece is just intersecting with this one node. Okay? Um, and now we can take this representation and try to understand what the restrictions or the constraints are for such a construction. For example, if we want to look at the way we fabricate, um, if we use a laser cutter, we have constraints on the intersection angle. We can only intersect at right angles. If you use a milling machine, we also have constraints. We cannot mill too flat into the material. Typically, we can go to about 45 degrees. If we want the objects to be rigid, um, we have, or let's say structurally stable, uh, we have constraints on how these things actually interact. Uh, we have to look at, ideally, the, the force flow among these objects. But then there's one thing that makes things even more complicated. We want to be able to assemble these designs. And this actually can be understood from looking at the graph. I'll just show you an example. If I design something like this, which you know I can easily do digitally, then there's no way you can assemble this piece. Um, in, re in turning this around, there's no way you can take it apart. right? Because every piece is connected to two at a different angle, so all the pieces are locked. And this is actually something that happens extremely quickly. If you work with a bunch of intersecting planes, you get into these locking configurations extremely quickly. So then here, in this simple toy example, the solution is relatively easy. You just make two of these planes parallel, and then you can slit out, for example, this one. In practice, um, this can become really complicated. So it's again an example where if you turn, if you change one piece, it has effect on all the others, potentially. You really, really don't want to do this manually. So here's a little video of the display of the um, system that we built. Here we just have you know, a spherical configuration and we have a bunch of these intersecting planes that you can manually position. And then when you let the algorithm run, it tries to find a solution that is as close as possible to your input that satisfies all the constraints that you can actually take these pieces apart. And when you play with the system, you know, you often see some very unintuitive behavior. You move one plane, and it affects a lot of the others. It's not easy to, to understand the constraints here. So we built a bunch of examples that I just want to show you. Um, this is a design where, it's a table base, pretty random, um, where we work with angled constructions. And you very quickly get into a fairly complex joints. Right? We just intersected these planes, and you end up with a joint like this. And if you're not careful, this joint locks very, very easily. And to understand this, we can look at the constraint graph. So remember that each of those numbers represents a piece. And whenever there's an edge between two pieces, it means that they're mutually intersect. So you have pieces like, for example, this one here, number four, which intersects with six others. Okay? It's extremely complicated to make sure that you're able to disassemble this. And the algorithm figures out a way to arrange the pieces in such a way that the construction is guaranteed. Here's an example where um, we work with orthogonal cuts and tight connections. And even though every pair of pieces intersects orthogonally, you can create doubly curved structures. Okay, so this thing is curved in this way, and it's also curved in that way. So that's something that might not be obvious. Uh, and again, you have to play with it. Again, the constraint graph is very complicated. Like, if you move a single piece, like say this one, it affects those two connected to it, so you have to change those. And if those are changed, all the ones connected to them have to be potentially updated as well. So any change propagates throughout the design. 
And here's an example where we use um, a laser cutter, but we made the slits wider so we can have these pieces intersect at um, different angles. But the resulting piece, even though every slit is loose, is still fully rigid. And I just want to show you one thing. very, very simple. Um, it's a, we call it a puzzle, but seven pieces, they're numbered, there's numbers on them, one to seven, and they're, they're designed or, or arranged in a ring, okay, so one piece is connected, one is connected to two, two to three, three to four, and then seven to one, okay, and you can prove relatively easily that you need at least seven pieces in order for no two planes to be parallel, okay, so let me just take it apart. And I challenge you to put it together again. Okay, the pieces are numbered, so you know which ones connect to which. Um, maybe you want to, want to try it out. It just, um, and we actually made the cuts a bit more open so it's easier. Uh, it's still very difficult. And the reason why it's difficult is that you have a cycle, right? the pieces lock up. And it's not in such a way that you can just put in the last piece connecting the six previous ones. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you play with it. But it's just to show that something as simple as this, a simple ring of seven pieces, can be actually really complicated to assemble. Okay, I don't know what's going on with my slides. All right, on to the, the last project. And this is very different. Um, this is now not optimizing for um, well, it is optimizing for shape, but really it is optimizing for performance, and in this case, lighting performance in some sense. And the, the project is called computational caustics, and I'll explain what that is in a second. The term caustics actually comes from Greek or Latin and means to burn. And the idea is that um, you can concentrate light with a lens or with a mirror to such high intensity that you, know, you can burn things. This is a, an illustration of a legend that apparently Archimedes built these mirrors to burn ships. Um, people try this out, that this doesn't work. At least it didn't work with the technology that they had at the time. But it is a re very real phenomenon. You might have seen this one, right? If you build um, concavely curved buildings with glass facades, be careful. Uh, it, particularly strange that this architect built this thing because you before designed already a building that burned things. We did it again. Okay. Here, of course, it's unwanted that you get these high concentrations of energy. But of course, uh, in many instances, you want exactly that to produce energy. But caustics are not just focusing light to a point. Um, they actually appear anywhere when you have light and some transparent or reflective object. So you all know this part. This is from the learning center. And they're particularly vivid when, you have, when you're dealing with water surfaces, right? Either reflective or refractive. Because the surface is not flat, um, it creates these interesting light patterns. And that's something that artists have used uh, in their designs. Oh, my videos don't play anymore. So here's a, a little art piece where you know, it's just a flashlight moving up and down. Uh, and there's different other surfaces that create these patterns of light. So our goal was to understand this process a bit better. And we're looking at, in some sense, the inverse question of what if we don't want these kind of random patterns to appear, but we want a very specific pattern to appear. At the same time, we wanted to capture this very specific and interesting visual aspect of these caustic, namely the fact that you can focus light really intensely to points. So our design problem was the following. If I give you a picture, let's say this one of Albert Einstein, let's say also with a signature, can I create an object that when light, for example sunlight, uh, is reflected off it or refracted through it, would actually create this image? And when we started this project, it was not clear if this is possible at all. So the goal is, you know, if you have something like the sun that, or flashlight or whatever it is, 
that passes through a transparent object, can we change the surface of this object in such a way that instead the image of Einstein is created? And it's a very complicated algorithm. I'm not going to explain it in too much detail. I'll just show you one thing. Basically, what we need to do is we need to divert the direction that light travels. And the direction in which light travels is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the shape of the surface. Right? You have a transparent medium. It's the orientation. You can use Snell's law to determine how the light is refracted. If you have a reflective surface, it's the curvature of the surface that determines how this works. So we have to find a way to change the geometry in order to change the direction of light rays. And we have this formula. We use a technique that's called optimal transport, which I will not illustrate uh, mathematically. I'll just show you what it does. So if this is the input illumination of our flashlight, and we want to paint this image, we'll just discretize these two domains. And we run an optimization that warps one into the other. So what you see here, these Voronoi type cells, the size of the cell actually corresponds to um, the inverse brightness. So the bigger the cell, the darker the image should become. Okay. That's what you, what you have to compute. Let me skip this. I'll just show you some examples. So here we have an example where we wanted to create um, a surface that when light passes through, paints the Olympic rings. Um, this is what the algorithm calculates. This is what the surface looks like. And then when you fabricate it and shine light through it, indeed, you get something that creates the Olympic rings. So I can probably even show it here on the projector. Um, so if you have the right distance, um, you get this. The projector light is not the best, but um, you can see how that works. Um, you can trivially add color. This is not so interesting. You just put a oil in front of it. But what this shows is where the light rays come from. So everything that's red here will eventually end up on the red ring. Okay, so it's really a very non-uniform um, distribution. Here's the Einstein example. Um, if I use the projector, let me insert a new slide. That's actually right. Okay, get some light. Um, so here you see the Einstein. Um, What's interesting with this one is that if I go close, you see this line in the center. And here we said to the algorithm, set, um, we specified that one third of the light should go to the signature, and two thirds should go to the picture. Um, yeah, projector, you get these squares. It's not the best light source. But you can see you get these rather interesting, almost three-dimensional effects when you turn the object around. Um, yeah, this is the video. And the last one is this brain example. Um, in this video, let me go back to the right page. So here, um, what what is interesting with this one is again you can see how the light is moved from the original distribution and then at the focal plane um, turns into this brain. What's interesting, or at least I find interesting here, is that the shadow of the head actually has the same intensity or same lack of light as my hand. This is a completely transparent object. There's nothing that blocks light, yet you have a completely dark shadow. And the reason is that all the light is going into these bright lines. They are much brighter than you know, the surrounding light of the beamer. So it's really focusing um, light to this point. And in some sense, it's kind of counterintuitive that you can do complete shading with a completely transparent object. Right. OK. Um, basically done. If you want to know more, um, there's a website where you can see uh, more images. Um, I actually forgot to put that in here, but I can show you in a second. Some of you might have seen an installation at the Rolex Center with these four metal plates that's using the same technology. Um, a lot of people helped on this, references, find some links there. Um, just a very brief conclusion. I think, um, you know, a lot of the 
the things I talked about are tools um, that allow you to do things, but more importantly is the process of how to use these tools and how to come about them. But in the end, it's really about the people. So I think you know, if you want to um, kind of advance into new domains, uh, and now everything is you know, talking about digital technology, the goal is not for architects to become computer scientists. I think the only viable approach is to, as an architect, learn um, some basics of computational technology so that you can actually effectively collaborate with people in other disciplines. This is something I guess you learn anyway, you know, working with structural engineers, working with clients. <laughs> there you have to really learn how to communicate. And it's similar with computer scientists, and I think there's a lot of common commonalities um, that we can explore. Now, what do you do with this? I think the biggest challenge is how do you take something like this, which you could argue is a bunch of toy project, and turn this into architectural practice? And how can you take all the, the promise of new technological developments, like new materials, um, digital fabrication, robotics, and all these things into architectural practice? And before I close, I just want to sh point you to one thing that I think is very promising in this company. Uh, some of you might have heard there is a new National Competence Center for Research on Digital Fabrication, uh, mostly housed in Zurich, but with participation of two people from here. And it really brings together um, people from a lot of different disciplines. This is actually an old slide. There's some new PIs now. But from architecture, structural engineering, uh, material design, computer science, robotics, and so on. And it has some really cool facilities in Zurich. Here's some pictures of some of the recent projects uh, using ro robots to assemble complex structures. Here for it's kind of like a large scale 3D printer. And this is a picture of the building. So this NCCR will be housed in Zurich in this new building that is under construction right now. Um, this is what it looks like at this point, or a few weeks ago. It will open up next summer. And uh, I think it's really uh, an exciting opportunity to bring together these different disciplines to, to create something uh, fairly amazing. If you're interested, there's a website here with a lot more information about this. And one very last thing, there's a conference next year in Zurich the conference advances in architectural geometry um, that is organized by this, this center. I'm one of the um, program chairs. Um, we're going to have an exciting lineup of speakers, but also, um, you know, if you're doing research in this domain, um, there will be interesting workshops and uh, opportunities to present um, your own work. Okay, that's pretty much all I wanted to say now. I'm, I guess I'm a little bit over time. I hope I didn't bore you. Um, I can show you, while I'll answer your questions, I have a video that we just finished of this installation. If you don't have a chance to go there when it's sunny, um, this is what it looks like. Oh, it's a bit low contrast with the light coming in. But um, this was basically a project where we tried to take this technology into a larger scale. Uh, into an architectural context. Um, as you can imagine, maybe I didn't say much about the fabrication, but these pieces have been milled with very high precision uh, computer control milling machines. Um, scaling that up to one by one meter was not trivial. Uh, we're looking for a long time to find the right partners to do this because this is not something we can do here on campus. Um, and also, we had this additional challenge that these pieces are exposed. They've now been up for about five months. Uh, I never expected they would last that long, to be honest. Um, but they still seem to work okay. Um, and now, our goal was to have them up for one year, so the interesting thing here is when you work with the sun, of course, is you cannot control the sun. The sun is where it is. Um, and of course, the sun changes over the course of the day and over the course of the year. And that means that the images that are generated will be different every time you go Sometimes, of course, if you have a day like this with clouds, you won't see anything. Uh, but when the sun comes up, you see stuff. And in winter, they get more and more distorted okay, because the sun goes lower. Oh, yeah, be careful when you walk into the beam because they do focus the light quite a bit. Uh, if you put your hands over them, you can feel the heat uh, if you're in the right spot. You can see in the shadows up there, you know, wherever the hand is becoming smaller, that's the end of it. 
um, you have high concentrations. So we, if you're at the right spot, you get something like 10 to 20 times the intensity of the sun. So don't, don't look straight into it, it's not a good idea. All right, thank you very much.